Hello and welcome to the Audio Epics podcast and the penultimate episode of The Beast of the Western Wilds, A Witch Hunter Tale. So, next week comes the last episode. And as soon as that has aired, the uh, Bandcamp downloadable, purchasable version in high quality will come online as well. And um, very soon we will also have a CD version. The only reason why um, we're still waiting a little bit for the CD version is because uh, a friend of mine is working on a cover illustration um, that I really want to use on the cover. And um, I'll wait until that's finished. It's going to be a painting, actually. And so until that painting is finished, um, so that we can use that on the cover of the CD version of The Beast. But I'm sure most of you right now are not really interested in that. You're interested in how Ludlow is going to vanquish this demon. Is he going to vanquish the demon? Well, let's find out, shall we, in episode 7 of the Beast of the Western Wilds. The Black Pool There Ludlow stood, at the edge of the black pool, with the glowing chain wound over one shoulder, Fulcrin perched on the other. I'm sorry, old friend. You cannot follow me where I'm going now. The falcon gave a sad squeak, and then took off. As he watched his companion fly up high into the forest canopy, Ludlow sighed. <sighs> He took off his cloak and unbuttoned his leather jerkin. He got rid of the heavy clothes, but decided to keep wearing his laced shirt. Then he laid the clothes beside a nearby log. He also took off his broad-brimmed hat and laid it on top of the log. He would not be taking it with him into the pool. Ludlow knew he owed the people of Schnatwald the very best that he could deliver. He had done precious little to help them so far. Rudolf's death still weighed on his conscience, and even in the fight against the Snatchers, Captain Elsenbach and Fulcrin had both been far more effective combatants than he had been. The Witch Hunter had to make up for his previous failures. He needed to live up to his name. Still, he had no idea what was going to happen. He had never heard of a witch hunter physically entering the realm of a demon. What if he became ensnared in her clutches and ended up just like Countess Ingelil? Then he reminded himself that the Countess had given up her soul willingly, something Ludlow had no intention of doing. Little Greta must have been a remarkably courageous child. He tried to diffuse his own anxiety. How was he to do this? He wouldn't just jump into the pool, but neither did he want to be drawn in against his conscious will, as had almost happened earlier on. So instead, he just took a step into the cold black water. He was already in knee-deep. It was too thick for water, and it clung to his trousers like some kind of oil. He hadn't eaten since the night before, but all appetite left him now. Reluctantly, he waded a bit further into the pool. The water, or whatever it was, stood up to his chest now, which was very cold, covered only by Rudolph's amulet and his shirt. Closer to the surface, it smelled like death. Firmly clasping the chain on his shoulder, he uttered the prayer, then took a deep breath and submerged himself in the blackness. As you stumble down and drip, 
fade away with every slip, you'll be forever in my grip. A chill wind, thunder in the distance, and a mocking voice laughing at him. Ludlov still held his eyes shut, but to his surprise, he found himself able to breathe. He could feel that he was lying on a rocky surface. His clothes were still wet, but the ground felt hard and dry. The laughter disappeared in the gloomy howling of the wind. Opening his eyes, Ludlov was confronted with the most depressing landscape he had ever encountered. Above the black earth rose billowing dark clouds, forever crawling up into a brown sky. He could hear thunder, but there was no lightning. Everything was dull and monochromatic. What had he done to himself? How was he ever to return to the world? As he slowly rose to his feet, he could hear other sounds. It was hard to make out what they were at first, but eventually he realized they were screams, echoing up and disappearing. Looking around, he saw how rough the landscape was. Jagged rock formations stuck out in all directions, and there were cracks and fissures in between. Some had brown or black smoke rising up out of them and so it continued on to the horizon. There was nothing to indicate that this field of death ever ended. One very conspicuous thing broke the monotony of his surroundings. Ahead of him rose a huge monument, or a tower, seemingly carved out of a mountain of smooth, dark grey marble. It was shaped as a slender arm with a thin wrist and long, delicate fingers. A woman's hand, but the fingers ended in long, sharp nails, like the claws of an animal. Ludlov was immediately reminded of his dream in Castle Edelhart. There was nowhere else to go, so he decided to make his way in the direction of this strange hand. Since he had to find his way around large boulders and chasms, the way was longer than it had seemed. As he approached, he also noticed that the structure was much larger than he had originally guessed. It had to be almost as tall as one of the spires of the Sanctissima in Seven Peaks. Carefully maneuvering his way around a narrow chasm, Ludlov heard a cry rising up. It had clearly come out of those depths. He cautiously looked over the edge. He saw the chasm walls descending down into nothingness. No one could be seen. He only heard that desperate voice again, somewhere deep, deep down in the abyss. It might have been the Countess or any one of the souls caught by this demon. How many had she ensnared so far? How many centuries had she been trying to influence the mortal world? Perhaps there were other gateways where she could manifest herself, beyond the Black Woods. Seeing that endless depth, Ludlow felt overcome with pity, but also fear. He turned away from the chasm and continued his journey. The trek was arduous and unpleasant. His mouth was dry and his stomach was empty. Apparently such sensations were not gone in the spirit realm. At least the massive chain wound around his shoulder proved to be almost weightless. When he came nearer to the construction, he saw that it arose out of a hill. Climbing the slope up to it, he couldn't help but marvel at the thing. It was a masterful creation, despite its profoundly evil nature. 
The enormous hand towered over him, the sharp nails reaching up to heaven. Was it a gesture of pleading despair or a hateful threat? By this time, Ludlove had concluded that it wasn't a building. There was no door to be seen anywhere, nor were there any windows. But when he had climbed the hill and found himself standing next to the gigantic statue, he could see the landscape beyond the hill. And that told Ludlove just how huge the thing really was. He saw an enormous crater, many miles wide, expanding out into the distance. It was also at least a mile deep, and part of the downward slope exposed more smooth marble. It was the rest of the arm, leading all the way down to a shoulder and a face, half buried under the rocks and pebbles of the landscape. The colossal statue depicted a woman who seemed to be drowning in the earth. On her carved face was an expression of terror and hatred. Her mouth was at the very deepest point in the center of the crater, and it was wide open. Ludlove looked into that dark mouth. It was the only place where he might have any hope of finding something different than the endless emptiness surrounding him. And so he began his journey down into the crater, stepping, sliding, and climbing, past jagged outcroppings, over boulders, and through heaps of loose gravel. As he approached the enormous stone face, his sense of dread grew. He jumped from the rocks onto the face and made his way down to the cavernous mouth. Standing on the lower lip of the statue, he peered into the void. There were steps leading down, but it was too dark to see any more beyond that. Santa Gwendala, pray for me. Ludlove entered the mouth. To his surprise, the white metal chain he carried with him provided all the light he needed to see the rough-hewn tunnel walls and the steps in front of him. And so his journey continued into the depths. He was alone with the sound of his footsteps, and despite his growing apprehension, he found his mind strangely at peace. He was a man on a mission, even if he had no idea how to accomplish it. As he descended, the air became warmer and more moist. The rocky walls slowly turned into something smoother and softer. There was a thin coat of mucus on it. It felt organic, like it was actually inside a living person's body. Then it became stranger still. There was a soft, inviting light in the distance. It had a golden hue to it, and with it, came the pleasing smell of some exotic perfume. When he came closer to the light, he saw that the light originated from an open door to the left of the foot of the stairs. After the final step, he entered through the door. He was inside an enormous tent of dark purple satin. It was easily the size of the hall in Edelhart Castle. From the vaulted ceiling dangled many lamps on golden chains, as well as veils of silk in many hues of red and gold. There were so many of these veils that he couldn't see to the other side of the tent. The ground was entirely covered with golden coins and littered with cushions. The sweet scent was intoxicating. The laughter arose again. Ludlove knew this whole environment was meant as an aid in a game of seduction. He steeled himself for what was to come. 
clasping the chain, he stepped into the room, slowly walking over the gold to the other side. There were golden braziers to his sides, where flames danced more slowly and sensually than fire normally would. The veils billowed as a soft breeze rose up towards him, bearing with it an even more seductive perfume. Bloodlove froze where he stood as he saw a silhouette moving beyond the veils. He recognized the provocative walk right away. The veils parted as the demon approached him. In his dream, she had been only a shape, but now he saw her basking in the light of the many lamps and braziers. She was the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, but her skin was the color of blood, and her hair was so deeply black that no light reflected from it. She wore nothing but golden jewelry on her ears, wrists and ankles. Terror and desire were at war within him, as she came towards him step by step, smiling invitingly. Her emerald eyes gleamed with pleasure. So, one who enters willingly. Enter then, visitor. Be welcome. I invite you in. Her raised eyebrows and coy smile made it very clear what she meant. Ludlove knew what was happening. He would have to be extremely careful, for he had seen even the strongest of men succumb to the lure of the flesh, especially when they had thought themselves capable of resisting it. Ludlove had ways to combat seductive voices, a discipline he had learned in order to counter the servants of the Black Sickle. But he was not sure if he could use that discipline here. She was a demon, far more powerful than any cultist. And she had both the promise of her body and the promise of power and knowledge to wield as her weapons. He would have to be swift. I have not come here to be devoured by you, demon. I am here to banish you. <laughs> Banish me? Where would you banish me? This is my realm. There is nowhere else to go for me. Then what are you doing in the Western Wilds? Castle Edelhart, you mean? I was visited by its lord and lady once. I simply returned a courtesy. Do not blame me if you don't think my kind should be welcome there. It's not your castle, is it, Ludlov of Seven Peaks? Ludlov was shocked to hear her speak his name. She smiled again, drawing very close to him. He tried to look away from her perfect shapes, her voluptuous lips and her enticing expression. He hated how difficult that was. Don't be afraid. Yes, I know your name. I know many things. But have I ever hurt you, witch hunter? She gently caressed his cheek. Did I send my beast after you? No. I didn't even react when you hurt the poor creature. Holding his face in both hands, she pouted her lips. Why must you be so mean to me? Why can't we be good to each other? Don't you believe in love, kindness, compassion? I'm just a creature like you. I just want to live. To survive, left alone by those who would hunt me down. Gradually, she had pushed herself against Ludlov's chest, and now she rested her head on his shoulders. He found himself listening to her words, 
contemplating them, seeing the reasons behind them. Then reason left him, as she buried her face in his neck and he was overwhelmed by her perfume. He felt her breath on his skin, tingling into his pores. Her lips were warm, and her tongue was warmer as it began to explore his neck. <laughs> then an agonizing shock went through his entire body, and he suddenly knew again where he was. It chilled him to the bone when he noticed he had already been holding her in a gentle embrace. The painful experience hadn't come from the demon, but from the chain, he realized. Stepping back, he unwound it, holding it in both hands. What are you doing? We were headed somewhere beautiful. Be still, snake. These are familiar to you, aren't they? Her friendly demeanor began to turn as her expression cooled. In my domain, you do not ask the questions, Ludlov. I order you! I order you in the name of the goddess! You will stand down and answer my questions! She laughed, <laughs> like he was a dear child acting far too serious for his age. Oh, Ludlov, what have they been teaching you up there? We are not as bad as you think. I order you to speak the truth! He extended the chain, holding it like he was about to strangle her with it. <laughs> you witch hunters, with your orders, your violence and your principles. Down here, everything looks different. Believe me. Inside of me, you will find the real truth. That there is no truth. No one great truth, that is. Only what truth you make for yourself. And nothing is more wonderful than that. Because there will be no more need for orders, or violence, or principles. The only order is to follow your true desire. The only violence is when you finally kill that silly voice bleating in your head every day. And the only principle is that of absolute relativity. Now, follow your desire and come to me. She approached him again with those seductive eyes, and he knew he had no time to lose. He concentrated deeply and sought out the hurt that lived deep within him. The memory of his wife's brutal murder boiled up until he felt it as physical pain, piercing through his head and spine like a spear. Then it suddenly ebbed away, and he was left standing there, tired and confused. The demon smiled. Why would you do that to yourself, you poor man? You deserve better than all that pain. Let me help you. Ludlov closed his eyes. Somehow, she had undone his shield of pain. There was no more time for defense. He had to bound her now. In the name of the goddess, I order you to stand down and reveal the truth, Adamaris! <gasps> <laughs> Adamaris, did you think my name was Adamaris? Confused, Ludlov simply held his ground, still holding the chain. Poor, sweet little witch hunter. She came nearer again. At this point, the realization suddenly came to Ludlov that he was utterly powerless. Without the name, 
Even Greta couldn't escape the clutches of the Bog Witch. And here was no witch, but a demon. There was nowhere to go, nothing to say or do. He was lost. She would be devouring his soul, and he would be forgotten, like so many others, slipping down the eternal darkness of her domain. I do know an Adamaris, the demon said innocently. She deftly avoided the chain and moved to his side, tracing the line of his face and neck with her finger. Her gleaming black nails were long, but they weren't the claws he had seen in his dream. Rather, the sensation of their sharpness carving a path across his skin was very pleasant and unmistakably real and physical. Adamaris and I didn't get along so well. Ludlov grabbed her by her wrist and faced her. You may be pretty, demon, but you forget who stands before you. I see through your empty promises. I have no interest in your body. Mm, a strong man. I like that. You're not a very good liar, though. I know what you think think you want. You think you want information. To know who killed your wife. And why. I know you miss her. I know you still love her. She grabbed the back of his hair and pulled his hair to her lips. Expect nothing like that from me, Ludlov. I do know who killed her, and I know where to find them. But you won't hear it from these lips, because I'm here to prove something to you. As much as you desire your revenge, Ludlov the Pure. You desire me more. She softened her grip and looked him in the eye once more. What's done is done, you know. Revenge won't bring back your wife. Nothing will. It's time to let go. I will give you an experience no woman on earth could match. Not even your precious Maria. Ludlov knew those words should have infuriated him. But they didn't. Instead, he felt his resolve weakening. And he lost the ability to think. He couldn't understand what was happening. He had given up all desire for such pleasures years ago. His strength of will was his greatest asset. Why was it that he couldn't think of anything now, except his desire for this infernal beauty? He firmly clasped the sacred chain and closed his eyes. The demon darted a quick glance at the white metal. Drop that, will you, dear? You don't want to miss what I have to offer. Then she took his face in both her hands, pulled him close to her, and kissed him. Out of her soft lips came a wave of strange sensations. So strong that he lost all his strength and dropped the sacred chain to the ground. He fell on his knees, and the demon knelt down with him. Don't bother escaping. She caressed his hair. It's not possible. That's what you get for entering the realm of an angel, armed only with a chain and... <laughs> the wrong name. Then she looked into his eyes very intently, and he thought he saw the movement of twisting branches 
and the various shades of green in her irises. I am going to devour your soul. But you might as well enjoy the process. Trust me. All men do. Bloodlove steeled himself, holding her by her arms, trying to push her away from him. But she was impossibly strong. Adamaris was the witch hunter who bound you, wasn't she? She simply smiled mm. while she took his weakened hand and laid it on one of her bare breasts. Well, I'm not bound now. So apparently she wasn't as effective as she thought, hmm? She guided his hand, letting it caress the side of her body and rest on her hips, laying him down on his back on the soft cushions of her lair. She was now beginning to untie the laces of his shirt. Ludlow tried to think, but he felt his resistance waning and his desire growing. With his conscious mind, he still knew what she was, but somehow even that didn't give him the strength to withstand her advances. Everything about her seemed so impossibly wonderful and beautiful. She positioned herself astride him, looking down with lustful eyes. He had to resist. But he felt like every bit of moral resolve he had once possessed was melting away. He tried to think of his beloved Maria, but he couldn't even remember her face now. Santa Gwendala, pray for me. He turned his head away from the shapely body on top of him. Pray for me, Santa Gwendala. Pray for me. Do not let this demon take me. Pray for me. You are a long way from the heavens, friend. The demon put her lips to his chest once more, and her perfumed hair tickled his face. There are no saints here. Then, she opened up his shirt and found the amulet there. She immediately recoiled. What is that? Suddenly, waking up from the demon's spell, Ludlow immediately took the chance to push her away from him. He crawled upright with all the haste of a hare escaping a wolf, and pulled the chain from the floor. The demon sat kneeling on the ground, pointing at him. Where did you get that thing? Ludlow grasped the amulet in his hand. She feared it, more so than even the chain. He had no idea why that was, but he would not be wasting the opportunity. Santa Gwendala, ora pro me. Dea, dimite debita mea. Dea. Dimite debita mea. The demon covered her ears. There is no need for foul language, Ludlow. Santa Gwendala, please hear me. From the depths I beseech thee, pray for me, intercede for me. Let the love of our beloved goddess shine down upon Stop thee. Stop that! Stop that! It's no use. It will just annoy me, and you won't get out of here anyway. Goddess, I am weak, but for the sake of the people of Schnatwald, give me strength. I beg you. The demon got up again, and once more she approached, but her beauty no longer held any power over Ludlow. He could see her now for what she was, a fraud, a lie, an empty promise. He held the chain firmly in both hands and raised it up. Fool! She let her hands glide over her own body. You could have had all of this. But instead, I'll now just take you the painful way. With that, two enormous bat wings suddenly emerged from her back, and her green eyes lit up like burning coals. Ludlow held firm. Santa Grandala, do not let me fall into this depth. As the demon came closer, her wings were all around him. Her mouth opened impossibly wide, and out of it came an outstretched hand, thin, black and diaphanous, like a living shadow. Its long nails curled and grew, just like in his dream. Santa Bernala, 
intercede for me with the goddess. Please hear me! As the darkness enveloped him, he heard a voice. It was nothing more than a whisper, but it was clear and bright, like a loving mother whispering a helpful word in her son's ear. Seeing the shadowy nails twisting around his legs and torso, the demon's hateful green fiery eyes drawing closer, he took a deep breath and cried out the name he had heard. Krasualdin! Immediately, the shadows dissipated and the wings shrank away. A look of abject terror appeared in the demon's twisted face. Her eyes still burning. Don't! Don't say it! You don't know what you're doing! In the name of the goddess, I order you to stand down, Grosualdin! As he spoke that name a second time, the demon retreated fearfully, and it suddenly became very cold around them. The light in her eyes died, and her face became beautiful once more. Tears streamed down her cheeks as she held up her hands in a desperate plea. Please, don't do this! Ludlov swung the chain at her, and it coiled itself around her. Immediately the metal links buried into her skin, and smoke rose from her flesh as she cried out in burning pain. Supported by the sword of Santa Gwendala, I order you in the name of the Holy Goddess and her daughter, the Sacred Maiden, to reveal the truth, Krasualdin! At the third naming, there was a flash of darkness. For a moment, nothing could be seen, and Ludlov simply stood there, listening to the screams of the demon. Then, a pale green light emerged from some unseen place, and the witch hunter could see that the entire environment had changed. The satin tent was gone. They were in a damp, muddy cave. The silk veils were replaced by gloomy tendrils of dead roots, and the demon was forced to reveal her true shape. A bent, twisted, wrinkled figure stood before him, writhing in pain, hairless and decrepit, with layers of dry skin dangling from her neck and arms. Her eyes were pale and her teeth were crooked. She looked like a woman hundreds of years old, and she was inextricably bound in the white metal chains. The sacred matter burned her, and she screamed in terrible agony. Down! Down! She fell to the floor, twisting like a worm. When at last she stopped resisting and lay still, the burning ceased. Now, I need to know. Where do you come from, Krasualdin? The face that turned towards him was deformed by hatred. She spat black mud at him, but Ludlov ignored it. Were you once an angel? I am an angel. Then what are you doing down here? I'm here because I was loyal. Loyal to the great one, Lucas. When he turned, I turned. And when he was imprisoned, you fled into your own realm. There is nowhere else to go. We have to flee the tyrant of heaven. Every word that came out of her mouth was filled with loathing and anguish. How did you get out? How did you get out? Edelheim. Before that, you were chained beneath the chapel by Adamaris, weren't you? How did that happen? I was first released by the Edelheim's generations before. I gave them their status. I gave them the country, the castle. It all came from me. It all belongs to me. They belong to me. And one day, one of the Edelhards decided they no longer wanted your influence, and they sent Adamaris to chain you. They thought they could escape their fate. No one can escape their fate, witch hunter. It is not I, 
they who plunge them down that darkness. They plunge themselves. Just like Lucas and all his followers. You are lost, demon. She cackled just like Ludlov had always imagined the bog witch from the fairy tale world. We cannot die. Our hatred is immortal, and the foolishness of men is without end. We will always keep devouring your kind. Ludlov pulled at the chain, making it sink deeper into her cursed flesh. One day, it will end, Krasualdin. And then you and all your kind will be forever locked out in the void. There you may exist, forever. Krasualdin hissed, <laughs> then grinned at him. I was privileged to have some limited foresight, witch hunter. And I do not lie. I tell you now, the darkest days are yet ahead. Lucas will rise. But that will not even be the worst. After that, a time will come when evil will be called good, and good will be called evil. In those days, we will dance for joy, and your kind will laugh as they fall willingly into damnation. A fire burned in Ludlow's heart as he glowered down at the deep. If that day comes, then the end of your kind will be near, Filth. Our goddess will not suffer you to spoil the earth for long. And as for you, Krasiwaldin, your hold on the Edelhearts is over! You forget one thing, Ludlov of Seven Peaks. <laughs> I still have the beast. I call off my game. It's not fun anymore. The rules are suspended. It's the beast's turn now. Let it run wild and free. Let it kill where it may. <laughs> she laughed a hollow, spiteful laugh, echoing through the gloom. Ludlow tugged at the chain again, letting it squeeze into her demonic flesh. But she just laughed through her pain. A deep rumbling came from somewhere below. Something was coming, and it sounded ominous. But there was one more burning question on his lips. My wife! Who killed her? The Black Sickle! That's just a name! Who are they? The earth began to tremble beneath Ludlov's feet, almost causing him to stumble. A moment later, pebbles rained down from the cavernous ceiling above. Tell me, demon! Krasuwaldin just kept cackling as larger rocks started toppling down nearby. Ludlov clutched the amulet in his hand. In the name of the sacred maiden, I order you! to tell me something about the Black Sickle! Ask the young witch! The young witch? He didn't understand, but neither did he have time to wonder about it. He heard a thundering crack and looked up. A huge boulder had come loose. It fell straight down and landed right next to the witch hunter with a massive, earth-shattering crash. Now the ground itself began to rip open as it started to rain pebbles and dirt onto Ludlov's head and shoulders. Still he held the chain and the amulet in his hands, knowing there was nothing else to hold on to. Where is your heavenly tyrant now? Witch hunter! Where is she now? You will be in tune with me forever! Together! Forever, my witch hunter! <laughs> Ludlov darted out of the way of a rock, but another one hit him in the neck. He fell down onto his chest as the searing pain spread to his head and into his spine. When he looked up, he saw nothing but rocks piling up around him. 
tumbling over each other and rolling down. The demon was nowhere to be seen or heard anymore. As one boulder crushed another nearby, a stream of gravel began to pour down on top of him. He coughed and teared up. He wanted to scream, but the dust in his throat reduced it to a hoarse whisper. Help me, goddess. Then a torrent of rocks and gravel came down and buried him in total dark.